الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Today, inshallah, we'll be starting with two beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Ali and Al-Kabir subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of Ayat al-Kursi, we read this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Al-Ali means the Most High, and Al-Kabir means the greatest. We talked about the name of Al-Azim, which also refers to the greatness. Greatness belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear in Quran al kareem and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained it in the hadith. That greatness belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only to Allah, no one else. And anyone that tries to get into that and prove any type of greatness for himself, that person is just like trying to pull something away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that does not belong to anyone else. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, which is hadith of Qudusi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Al-kibriya'u rida'i wal-azamatu idari. Greatness is my sheet. And of course, this is only an example that just as human beings have their clothes, we have our clothing that are just attached to our body. And these are my clothes. I cannot, while I'm wearing these, I cannot give it to someone else. If I give it out, it means now they will be on someone else's body, but they won't be on my body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this is how greatness is. This is something that belongs to me, is attached to me. Whoever will try to Pull away one of these two things away from me, which means the upper sheet or the lower sheet. Kibriya and Azama. Both refers to the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, These are my upper and the lower sheet, it's just like that. So if a person is trying to take these things and claim greatness for himself, as if this true person is trying to snatch my cloth away from me. So greatness and all kind of greatness belongs to Allah only. Once a person will realize and when human being would realize that really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is great, He is Kabir, He is Azim, He is Al Ali, He is the highest, He is the greatest. We will realize that we are really nothing. A person starts looking at the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the time when the person will be able to see that what's my position. Because normally a person feels that he's great when he looks at others that are below him. A person who considers himself to be standing on a high place and he looks down at everyone else, the only mistake this person may be making when he's looking at everyone that's down there, he's on the second or the third floor of a building, and he looks down, and he considers himself to be higher than everyone else, the mistake this person may be making is that he's not looking above him. There may be another person that's standing on the tenth floor and looking down at him. If this person will look, will look up, right away he will realize that there is someone above him. 
and much higher than him comparing to what he is in comparison to the other people that are down. He may be on the second story and he's looking down at others that are on the street, but there is another person who's on the tenth story. So, a person will only look at himself and consider himself to be great, to be something. When we look at those and compare ourselves with those who we feel, they are blows. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran and beautifully explained in Surah Luqman when Luqman advised his son وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَةً Don't walk arrogantly on this earth. إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضِ By walking arrogantly on this earth, you can never make a hole in the ground. When you step very strongly on the ground, you feel that you are something. You are not going to break the ground with your steps. And when there are feelings within you that are telling you you are so great, you are so high because of some position, look around and you will see some mountains. You cannot get to the height of the mountains. Each and every mountain that we look at, it reminds us that there are so many things that are higher than us. And regardless how high we get, there is something higher than us. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of his attribute, Al-Ali. He is the most high. And the, when we talk about that position, being higher than others, subhanallah, when you look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just according to our imagination, when we think about the greatness of Allah, we would realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above everything. He is above everything. And not only just everything that we see, He is above our admiration. We can admire Him as much as we want. And He is above that. Not only just admiration, He is even above our imagination. Imagine the highest position that we can think of. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. Try to attach every greatness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. When we think of the highest thing you can think of, and the greatest position you can think of, and if we try to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this high simply means we have not understood Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala because think of the highest position and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. This is an ulu. This is the real greatness that beyond imaginations. If a person would think that I could imagine how great Allah is, this person have not understood the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above anything and everything. And there is no situation in this world that is out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's control. He is above every situation. There is no thought that can travel anywhere in the world even our thoughts, as they go so fast and they are thinking about every different parts of the world, millions of miles away, and we are thinking of those things, no matter how high we get, how far we get, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above everything. So, this ulu, this greatness, belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. And when it comes to human being, we can really see that our attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets very strong when we realize our position. And our position is when we look at our reality. 
This is why there is a saying in Arabic, رَحِمَ اللَّهُ إِمْرَأً عَرَفَ قَدْرَ نَفْسِهِ May Allah bless a person who realizes his position. Many times we make mistake only when we forget our position. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore in Qur'an al-Kareem keeps on reminding us again and again our position. That what are we? Where do we belong to? Very simple way of looking at our souls as some of the scholars have explained. That said when shaitan starts deceiving us and we start having different thoughts about our souls, don't think of yourself at this time. Just postpone these thoughts until when you go to the washroom. And then when we are sitting in the bathroom, then just start bringing that topic to yourself and think what is our position. And then we will realize where do we belong to. When a person is sitting in there, in a position where you don't want anyone else to share this bathroom as soon as you leave, not just with you, as soon as you leave you don't want people to go into that bathroom. Now this person who thought so much of his greatness would realize his position. And if a person would not realize his situation and his position even at that time, simply means this person is out of his mind. This person, his brain is not functioning well. He really needs some treatment, some cleaning up of his brain, of washing it up properly. So that we'll start seeing realities of life. One is what people tell me. You are this. The other is what I see myself being in that situation. And as they may say, that a picture worth a thousand words. So, people can tell us thousand words of our greatness. That one picture that we see of our souls is enough to tell us everything. The point is we need to realize our position and our situation. It reminds me of Malik ibn Dinar rahmatullahi alayhi. A person, and of course, those great people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed with a lot of wisdom and understanding. As he was going somewhere and he sees a slave woman who was considered to be very honorable, she's a slave. But because she was owned by a person who was very wealthy and she had a very close position with him, so therefore she was considered to be holding a very high position in that society. And her master has assigned a lot of other slaves men and women with her, to serve her, to be with her. As she's going and all of her workers and slaves that are supposed to work for her are with her, they're following her. Malik ibn Dinar looks at her and he say, calls her and says, Excuse me? Yes, what do you need? By looking at you, I could imagine I can, something is telling me that you are a slave woman. Yes, I am. Would your master sell you? She looks at him and she says, even if he would do that, do you think a person like you would be able to buy me? Can you afford to buy me? He said, why not? So she says to her slaves that are around her, that it looks like this person is 
just like a madman, we will have a lot of fun to have with this person around us. Pick him up, take him with us. We will take him to our master and tonight we will have some fun with this man. So, they take him and they don't know who this person is. She goes back to her master and she informs him. And imagine now, look at the word slave women. And then she's considered to be higher than a lot of other people that are free people in that society. This is when a person just looks at some position and starts looking at his, placing himself at certain position. Oh, I hold a very high position in this community. So when she explained everything to the master and he calls Malik ibn Dinar and he doesn't even know who this person is because they have a total different lifestyle. They have no connection with these type of people. Hundreds of years later, Muslim children know the name of Malik ibn Dinar and at his own time, people living at his own town, they don't know who Malik ibn Dinar is. So, when she explained everything, he laughed at the situation and he called him. But as soon as he looked at his face, something went through his heart and he was afraid to even talk to him. So now he gets a little serious and he says to him that she was telling me this is what you said to her. He said, yes, I did say that. Did you say that you can afford to buy her? Look at your cloth, look what you're wearing. Look at your position, look at your situation. How could you say that you can buy her and you can afford to buy her? What do you think you will be paying for a price to buy something like this? So Malik ibn Dinar said, I can pay as a price, if you want me to set the price, I would pay you a seed of a date that is burned, not unburned, because that may have some better use. A burned seed from a date. So he says, very interesting, how did you set this price for her? Malik ibn Dinar says to him, and of course, it's something that fits on all of us, not just on her there, on every person. Beautiful reminder. He says to him, or her, and to him, the reason I sent this prize because I see a lot of defects in her. She is having a lot of extra hair on the body. If she won't clean those hairs, she would look ugly. Every morning she has to wash her face, rinse her mouth, clean her nose. If she won't do that, you won't even be able to be close to her to smell her, her mouth. And see how much dirt comes of our, out of her nose every day. If you start looking at that, you won't like her anymore. And then when she goes to the bathroom, you know, you can't even be close to that place. If you smell that place, you won't like her anymore. She has to take shower every day. She has to use so much perfume, imagine how much money is being wasted on that perfume. Only so that she will look good and she will smell good. Her own personal smell is so bad that if you won't take, she won't take shower for a couple of days, you will see the real smell that comes from her. And if she doesn't brush her teeth a couple of times a day, you won't even be able to look at her teeth. And I have a woman that doesn't have to take no shower. She doesn't need to use water. If she uses the water, the water will have good fragrance and beautiful smell because the water got touched to her body. She doesn't need to wash herself. She doesn't have no dirt in her body. It's only perfume. Even when if, she, if she would sweat, it will be perfume and it will be the best fragrance you could ever smell in your life. 
She doesn't need to brush her teeth. She doesn't need to comb her hair. Everything is naturally so pure and clean that she doesn't need to take care of any of these things. And he went on with the description. So the master, of course, the person who is in that type of life, he says, where is that? How can I get that? And for sure, comparing to what you're telling me, she worth nothing. He said, it's very easy. You have to marry her. You can't just do it like this. You can't buy her. You have to marry her. And her muhr is the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you perform the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is her muhr, and you will get her in the jannah. That's the hu. As soon as this master and that woman, both of them heard, they heard this, right away they decided that really this is what we would like to be. She says, this is what I want to be. I would like to be one of those women. He says, yes, you can be the leader of all of those women if you do the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will get her if you perform the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the mahar. Right away, he gives everything as a sadaqah and he starts following Malik ibn Dinar rahmatullahi alayhi. This is the reality. This is for us to realize what is our reality. And from this, we can also understand the reason I narrated this. We can understand when we read the description of the people of Jannah of Hur in Quran al Kareem. That would, should make us realize what is our position in this life. So once a person would realize his position, he would realize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once we know the greatness of Allah, we can see our position, they go together. And what's the benefit of knowing both of these? Once we realize the greatness of Allah, and then when we look at ourselves, we realize our real position, where we belong to, what are we, what we are made out of. That is the time when the person would be able to say, Ya Allah, I would like to be the closest person to you. I would like to have my attachment closer than anyone else in this world. And the reason is, you are the greatest and I'm the lowest. And Ya Allah, this is the best means I, f I find over there that I attach myself to the greatest because I'm the lowest. <clears throat> when a person feels that he is greater than anyone else, that's the time when his relation and connection with Allah is still weak. When you feel that, no, I'm the lowest, now you can really turn to the greatest one and you would feel that your attachment with Al-Ali, with Al-Kabir, with Al-Azim, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the greatest attachment that you can have. This is the beauty of realizing our position, realizing, knowing that we are nothing. And the lower we are, the more our attachment will be with the greatest, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Ali, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And... This is what we see in Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam, especially Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he lowered himself, and he was never thinking of his position, oh, I'm the leader of Anbiya, I'm this, people are not supposed to do this to me. He never would think of what I am. He is looking at what I'm supposed to do. And according to him, he feels, I'm nothing. I'm nothing because he's looking at the greatness of Allah at all times. And once a person is looking at the greatness of Allah, there is no way that he would consider himself to be anything. This is why the tasbih of sujood is subhana rabbi al-a'la. Glory to my Lord who is the highest. Because when a person is putting his forehead before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his forehead is down, at this time we can really realize that I'm nothing. Glory belongs to Allah and, high, and all of that greatness only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, 
whatever I was thinking of myself, my forehead is before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is down on the ground. So this is the connection that will be established when a person would realize that I am nothing and receives the greatness when a person will see the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more we see that, the more we will see that we are really nothing. What am I? I was comparing myself to other objects, to other things. But that's not something to compare. And I don't even know the reality of these things. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But when I look at the highest one, that is Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala, I realize that really I'm nothing. And that is the time when a person would really have the close attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was mentioning about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was never looking at his position. He was just considering himself to be nothing. Now the people of Makkah rejected him. He goes to Taif. Even in Taif, people rejected him. He leaves Taif. You don't see a single word in his dua, in his prayer saying, Ya Allah, didn't you tell me that I was the leader of Anbiya? Nothing like this. Didn't you tell me that I was the greatest human being? Didn't you tell me that I hold the position of Shafa'a in Akhirah? I'm the first person to enter the Jannah. Look at what these people are doing to me. Nothing like this. Humbleness. And humbleness doesn't mean, let me humble myself. Humbleness simply means, this is what I am. This is what I am. When he did this, when he went through all of this, and he never even thought, it never even came to his mind that I belong to any higher position. That is the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted him with that great gift known as Isra and Mi'raj. When according to him, he has just done everything and he never con considered himself holding any higher position Never complain about what's happening because of his position. That is the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes him to the highest position. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us some clear indication to this point also in Quran. Subhanalladhi asra bi abdi. Glory to Allah who took for Isra, took during the night time, his servant. Doesn't say, doesn't say his prophet. Asra bi Nabi, Asra bi Rasuli, Asra bi Muhammad, no. Asra bi Abdi, who took his servant, when he really proved himself to be Abd, to be the servant of Allah, Allah says, at that time I took him to that highest position. What made Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam humble himself so much? That was when he realized the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Seeing the greatness of Allah that showed him that really I'm nothing. And I can't even ask Allah anything of holding any position. All I can ask him, Ya Allah, please forgive me after whatever happens to me. Allah, please forgive me. Looking at the greatness of Allah. This is all I can ask him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Ali. He is the highest. And Al-Kabir. He is the greatest. And the whole salah we can see, Subhan Rabbi Al Azim, Subhan Rabbi Al A'la, and at every movement, Allahu Akbar reminds us of the greatness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This is the whole point of the salah. Of course, the dhikr of Allah and the dhikr that is chosen in salah is the dhikr, the type of dhikr that will remind us of the greatness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This will. Make us realize our position in this life. The next name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in this hadith is Al-Hafiz. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The preserver. The protector. The one that protects everything. The, the one that preserves everything that he has created and he has made. Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hafiz in Arabic language has two different meanings. One is to remember something. We say Hafiz al-Quran. The one who have memorized Quran. 
This is hafz. So to mem- remember something, to memorize something is hafz. Is the opposite of forgetting. And the other meaning of hafz is to protect something, to safeguard something, to take care of something. This is hafz. Not to be negligence. Not to let things be destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hafiz in both ways. He does not forget his servants. He does not forget us. Even when we forget ourselves, Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forget us. Even when we neglect our own souls, Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala does not neglect us. We will see some of these examples in a few minutes, inshaAllah. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hafiz because He protects us. He protects everything in this world. The sun that is giving the light for millions of years, and wallahu alam for how many millions of years, who is preserving that sun and the light of the sun? With such heat, so much fire and burning up there, why that thing is not burning up? And how come it's not burning other things that is around it? As some of the scientists may tell us, that the position of the sun is such, that if the sun was little closer to the world, it would burn so many different things in this world. And there will be no growth at some portions of the world because of the heat of it. And if it was little further than where it is, in some places of the earth, it will be so cold that no living being would be able to survive. Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected everything, has preserved everything in its proper position. So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creator, is khalaq, at the same time as Hafiz is protecting us. And he remembers us. Such a protector, subhanallah, such a protector who never forgets us. If he would forget, well, ayazu billah, well, ayazu billah, if there was anything forgetting there, human beings or anything that is forgotten by Allah will be destroyed right away. If we look at the creation of the world, we will realize that there are so many objects in this world that are very harmful to other things. This world is full of these type of things that one object is harmful to the other object. But Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala have created all of these things in such a way that each thing is being protected from its enemy and things that can destroy it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this fire. Imagine if the wind is blowing too high, it's going to put off the fire. Now, can we say, let's put on a fire at a place where no air can get there? You won't be able to put on the fire. The fire gets the oxygen for itself to burn from the wind, from the, from the air. It needs it. But the same wind can destroy it too. And Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala kept this air in such a position that it will provide the oxygen that is needed for the fire without just extinguishing every fire in the world. Two things that are opposite to each other. Fire and water, beasts and human beings. And nowadays we may say human beings and human beings. But Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting everyone. If it wasn't his protection. People would have destroyed each other long time ago. This world would not have been in existence. These beautiful plants and fruits that we have and the flowers that we have and the gardens that we have, they would not have been in existence. 
So many things are there to destroy them. Al Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala has created other objects that will protect these plants from things that can destroy them. Even within the human body, there are so many different things in there that are very harmful to each other if they start mixing with each other. If blood starts getting into the brain, it will just destroy the human being, human life. Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala has put it in such a way that blood is circulating throughout the body. Let us screen, let us skin peels off, you see some blood. But it's protecting within the body, it's protecting the places that where the blood is not supposed to go. Fluid inside the body. It's supposed to be at certain places and if it will go to other places, it's going to destroy them. Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting it within the same body. So many things are there that are harmful to each other. They can destroy each other. If they stand mixing, they will kill each other. The life will be miserable for a human being. He will be living in pain until he would die. Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting everything. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting us day and night. Day and night there is protection going on. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran al-Kareem. لَهُ مُعَقَّبَاتٌ مِّن بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Every human being has angels in front of him and behind him all the time that are protecting him with the permission of Allah, with the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, if these angels were not around human beings, shayateen and jinns will destroy human beings in seconds. They will cut them into pieces. This is how much shaitan dislikes human beings. But because of these angels that are protecting the human beings, he has no power over us. Muaqibat, protection, angels that protect the person in front of him and behind him. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah of Quran al-Kareem, He asks us a question. He says, with so many things that can destroy you in this world, if you look around you, Really, you won't see, feel safe living in this world. People are telling us we created so much weapon that can destroy this world ten times. With so many objects, so many things that are there to destroy human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions us now. Keeping this in mind of how this world is functioning and how many things are there that can destroy the human life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us this question. قُلْ مَنْ يَكْلَأُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَانِ See, who is protecting you day and night from Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala? That if Rahman, this is why the attribute Rahman is used, that if Rahman's Rahmah was not there, you would have been destroyed in seconds. You would not exist. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us this question, مَنْ يَكْلَأُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَانِ Who is protecting you day and night from Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala? Which means if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the other elements to attack you, even from within the body to attack us, we are gone. It's only Rahman's Rahmah that he is protecting us from all of these things that are harmful and they could really just destroy us. And subhanAllah, his hafz <coughs> protection is such, he protects things and people in very amazing ways. We know that there was a time when Fir'aun was killing all the children of Bani Israel. The boys of Bani Israel. And it was during the same period that Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was was born. The question is to protect this child so that as he would grow, 
he would receive the prophethood and do the work that he is assigned to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes that protection upon himself. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ نَرْضِعِيهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the mother of Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, gives her some instruction, this is what you should do, and I'm going to protect the child. And finally, as she was afraid, and she had this message that if you're too afraid of, about the life of this child, put him in a box and put the box in the river. And she does that. Where does the box go to? In front of the castle of a person who is looking for all the children to kill them. And finally, it ends up being in that castle. Look at Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala when he protects, how he protects. Look at his, prote uh, at his protection. That is protecting Musa alayhi salatu was salam by keeping him in the castle of a person who is trying to kill every, person, every other child over there. This is the hafs, this is the hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in reality, if you look at it, maybe even more than this. This is a beautiful example to understand the hafs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but more than this, if you look at it, you would see the miracle of protection of Quran. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not the protector of this book, believe me, people would have changed it long time ago. There was no way for us to get it in this original form the way we have it today if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have taken that responsibility upon himself as he says in Quran al-Kareem, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr We have revealed this dhikr, this Quran Wa inna lahu lahafidhun We are the protectors of it. I'm protecting it. As far as the previous books, how come they were changed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees and reveals that fact in Quran. بِمَا اسْتُحْفِظُوا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا عَلَيْهِ شُهَدَاء He says the previous books, I made that nation to be the responsible, gave that nation the responsibility of protecting that book. And they changed it. They themselves changed it. They didn't wait for other nations to come and change it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, as far as this Qur'an is concerned, the situation is different. He took it upon himself. He didn't tell us that you are supposed to save it. I will save it. But of course he uses us. But he took it upon himself that I would protect this Qur'an from any changes till the day of Qiyamah. And that is the, this is the only reason we have this book in its original form. It reminds me, when Britishers took over India, and they were studying on how to keep Muslims away from their religion, from their deen, because They took that land from Muslims. We know that. They took that land from Muslims. And now, there is a feeling within the Muslims at the time that we must do jihad against these people to take it back from them. What's the way to keep these people away from their deen, from their iman, and thus from the jihad? That was the question at that time. So they came up with a solution and they said, and really, they had a good study. And they said, this, the result of those studies was that the thing that is keeping these people attached to their deen, their iman, is Qur'an. Take the Qur'an away from them. During those days, that forbidden the printings of Qur'an in the countries that they were controlling. And they started burning the copies of Qur'an al-Kareem, they burned 
thousands or millions of copies of Quran. In that procedure, during that procedure as they are going around and collecting the copies from the masajid, the books of the history narrate that they went to one of the masjid where the imam is sitting with some children around him. So they go over there, they grab all the copies of the Quran from the children, take them out and burn them. So, the imam calls one of them and he says, what are you people doing? And subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows how he uses people for his deen, for the service of his deen. No one even knows who that person was, that imam was. In what village he was, what small masjid he was sitting in. But maybe his sincerity, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him for the protection of Quran. So he calls that person and says to him, what are you people doing? said, we are going to take all of these Qurans away from you people, or whatever else he has to say. So he calls one of the young children and says, read from this surah. No Qur'an is there. They had taken all the Qur'ans, the copies of the Qur'an. So the child reads that surah. He says, now read from that chapter, and he reads from there. So he says to him, what are you going to do with this? We don't depend on the Qur'an that is on these copies, on the paper. Quran is in our hearts. And we are going to make sure that this Quran will transform from, transfer from heart to heart. You can burn these physical copies of the Quran, but the one that's in the heart, there is no way that you can snatch it away from us. He went back and he gives that report, and they realized this is a reality. There are millions of Hafaz throughout the country. And if we do that, then these people will start even focusing more on memorizing Qur'an. So that is going to then be, it will reverse it, and it will reverse the whole situation, and there will be more hafaz of Qur'an. So if they stop burning the Qur'ans. Either way you go, you burn it, there is protection from the other side. More people will come to us. Perhaps. You don't burn it, copies are available to people. You choose what you want to do. And here we see that We are the protectors of it. We see that Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala how he's protecting everything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Hafiz. He is our protector. Once we realize this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remember this attribute, connect, uh, connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this attribute. We will remember that Al-Hafiz never forgets us. He never forgets us because he is Al-Hafiz. He always remembers us. And he never neglects us. He is always protecting us. Imagine if someone protects you from only one of your enemies, how grateful you would be to that person. Someone was trying to attack you and another person came and he protected you. You are sitting in the masjid, someone came and started cursing at you, Two people came, they grabbed that person, took him out of the masjid. How grateful you would be to these people who saved you from only one person in one time, just for, in, for a few minutes. They were protecting you. Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's protecting us from before we were born, before we came to this world, and continuously has his protection is there with us. Not only until we live even after with after that. He protects us and He protects each and every one of us from all of our enemies and from everything that harms us and destroy, destroys us. How grateful we should be to Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will tell us what type of connection we need to establish with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Al-Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala who is protecting us day and night, and only when he opens a little door, a little door towards any hardship, we see how we suffer. We can't take it anymore. Just something, he opens a small door to some hardships and difficulties, we can't take it. Imagine, pain in one tooth, we can't take it. If the pain is in all of our teeth, goes beyond teeth, 
if all other parts of the body will start having pain. We have never gone through that. One thing hurts and we feel the whole body is gone. Al Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much protection he's providing us day and night. Really, we need to be grateful to Al Hafiz subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of this protection so that insha'Allah, la in shakartum la azidannakum, if you be grateful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises, you will get more. Insha'Allah, we'll have more and more of his protection against all of the evils and fitnas from every hardship and difficulty in this world and akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to have this close connection with him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqoonu khawi hadha. Wa astaghfiru Allah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.